my uh, I've been asked to just share a little bit about what I do and how I got to where I am. So I hope it's of, of interest. Um, I have been a, a dentist in Australia for about 10, 11 years now. I graduated in 2009 from the University of Melbourne. And in Australia, uh, a lot of the dental schools uh, back then took us straight from high school. So you graduated high school, you'd be about 18. And a lot of students would actually get into dental school, medical school, and so on back then, um, directly from undergraduate high school. So you'd start your degree at about 18, 19, and you'd be graduated by 23. And I know that that's uh, not, not the way it works uh, in the States. We've started to change that model, and now it's similar, where you need to do an undergraduate degree first, and that could be in basic sciences, biomedical it could be anything. And then uh, the, these degrees are usually done as a doctorate or, or postgraduate, which is, I, I believe that's how it would work over there in the States. In any case, so in 2009, I um, was uh, admitted to my undergraduate degree. It took five years to complete. Uh, so I was, I was all done by 2005. Or, Sorry, all the way around 2005, I entered the degree, all done by 2009. Um, and then you kind of finish dental school and you are all excited to start practicing and seeing real patients. And you're quite confident when you first start. And then it, it really does take a couple of years for you to realize that you actually don't know <laughs> um, too much at all. So that is actually when the journey starts now that I'm looking back. So I then went on and did an oral surgery residency for 12 months. What that means is I worked at the local dental hospital in an oral surgery department. And we only, for a year, I was under the supervision of the oral surgeons. And we only saw, um, I was only exposed to oral surgery cases. So that would include things like uh, impacted wisdom teeth, dental implants, uh, oral and maxillofacial pathology, uh, things like fractured jaws and so on. Anyway, following that, I then completed about three years of general practice, uh, just working in a mix of private practice and community-based practice. Uh, and really, we were just doing a various range of general dentistry, ranging from emergency treatments to restorative treatments and so on. Um, then I commenced private practice only after about three or four years post-graduation. And I started to pursue my interest of cosmetic dentistry and implant dentistry. Uh, I actually completed a one year certificate in implants with Loma Linda University in California. Uh, um, that was actually initially starting in uh, Australia and we completed it in LA. And then from then I opened my practice, the Richmond Dentist, um, in 2017, so this is our fourth year. Um, and I guess from here, I'll just share with you guys some of the cases I, I do, a bit of behind the scenes. Uh, I'll go through a case with you from the moment they presented to me uh, to some of the planning that you go through as a dentist and then the execution and, and then the final treatment. Uh, I hope my accent is not too difficult to understand and if there is anything that you're not understanding, just uh, you can mention it in the chat if there's something that, um, that didn't make sense there. All right, I'll start by just sharing a video with, uh, with you all. Um, just bear with me one moment as I get it ready. Are you hearing me okay, guys? Yes, you sound great. Okay. So I'll start by just sharing a video with you. It'll, it's about a four, four or five minute video.
Sorry, guys. Sorry about that glitch. I'll just have to get it another way. One moment. No worries. I hear the situation over there is not fantastic in uh, with COVID. How are you all dealing with that at the moment? Just while we load this. Are you in lockdown or is it freedom at the moment or how is it in your state? Um, it's kind of right now on a state by state thing. Um, Texas mm. actually in Mississippi, I think just mm. repealed the statewide mask mandate, but everybody else still has it for the most part. So I think we're all just going to wait and see what happens there. Wishing, wishing you all like, you know, speedy return to normality guys, hopefully all, all, all sorted soon. All right, we're back. Sorry about that little glitch. No worries. Um, Dr. Tucson, I don't, there's no audio for it as of right now. I can't hear anything. Uh, there's no audio working at the moment? Yes, for the video. All right, how can we sort that out? Um, I think when you share your screen, there's like a little box that says like share, like let me check. At the bottom, there's a little box sound. that says share sound. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Let's try that again. Okay. possible care in dentistry. Our second is our passion for people as important individuals, uh, not just as our patients. What brought me here today is commitment from a very young age. I was inspired by my parents and I saw their dedication to helping people. My late father was a GP with an amazing medical knowledge. My mother is a dentist. She's so good with people and so talented. Seeing them and what they did every day made me realize that healthcare is an amazing way that I can give back to people. As I got older, I saw what dentistry could offer through my mum and her colleagues. As a dentist, I could be an engineer, an artist, a scientist, and sometimes a psychologist. I had a story that I wanted to share with you that really helped me reflect. Just the other week, I received a DM on my Instagram from a friend of mine that I haven't seen in 17 years. We used to sit next to each other in maths methods. It read, mate, I, look at you. I remember when you used to tell me in maths methods that you were going to be a dentist. That just made me reflect. It made me realize that sometimes we're so focused on our goal that you don't stop and enjoy the view. Uh, I really have been visualizing this since I was 15. After studying and practicing for 13 years collectively, I had my skill set and my passion. You know, I had that in one hand, and in the other hand, I had a patient base. Um, and I wanted to bring it all home, wanted to bring it all together. We were living in Richmond at the time and we found this amazing space. So the Richmond Dentist really is an environment that I can come to work every day and, and do what I love to do. And I have to give credit to my wife, who when it came to creating the space for me to work in, uh, she really had the vision. She knew exactly what I needed. Our practice is quite comprehensive, but we've built a reputation for natural aesthetics. We've been achieving natural aesthetics through a combination of Invisalign, dental bonding or resin bonding, and porcelain veneers. The other key focus of our practice is oral health. At the end of the day, it's our number one priority. Patients are there to know that they're becoming healthy and preventing dental problems. We're genuine Melbourne locals who are great at what we do. I, I think it's that simple. All of our dentists graduated at Melbourne University and are passionate about dentistry. We know our city and we know our patients. We listen, we're dedicated to natural results. We know that when somebody takes a plunge for cosmetic dentistry, they don't want the results to look fake. 
They don't want people to notice obvious dental work. The key is that when they smile, it looks like they've been like that their whole life. And that's what we're passionate about. When I built this place, I wanted to have the latest in dentistry. We use state-of-the-art equipment so we can bring to our patients what they didn't think was possible. It's also very nice to know that we work with some of the most talented ceramists in Melbourne. It's so good to come to work knowing you've got such an exceptional team. I say this all the time, you can have the world's best dentist, but if the ceramic work isn't also A+, unfortunately it just doesn't look right, and vice versa doesn't work either. So I'm very proud of this team, we've been working on it for quite a while now. Thanks guys, so not, not trying to, to plug to you guys all the way in, in the States there, but I figured it would be, it would be nice to just start with that. Sorry, just a moment. Okay, um, today I'd like to, so you may have seen uh, that there are, there's a lot of behind the scenes that goes on uh, as a dentist. So. Of course, step one is always uh, a person comes in for their very first uh, consultation, very first examination. And one of the most important things in my day is listening to that person that's come in. I usually spend an hour with, uh, with a patient the first time they come. Listening is, is such an important um, first step because every person has, has different goals. Someone might be coming to see me uh, because they're self-conscious about their smile. Somebody else may not give uh, any attention to the appearance of their smile and they're there purely for health and function. Um, and others are coming just because it's time for their you know, usual six monthly or 12 monthly uh, routine kind of clean and they wanna stay on top of their health. So step one, listening and getting to know the person that's come in. Um, probably one of my favorite parts of the of the practice is meeting new people um, it's nice to actually um, take interest in the people that have come to uh, to see you uh, as individuals not not just as someone with with uh, or, you know dental problems if you get what I mean so it's nice to get to know them on an individual level so what I might do just for the next 10 minutes or so is walk you through a case and Feel free guys to, at the end, if you had other questions or wanted to see other cases, I, I would be happy to. But let's just do this. The easiest way for me to do this would be to actually just, uh, I'm not sure if you could see my screen here. All good. Best way for me to do this, because these photos are already uh, posted, um, is just to, to walk you through some of the cases that, that I would do. So um, various examples of, Cases like this where a patient might enter, they're a little bit uncomfortable with their smile. Um, she has obviously suffered from tooth wear and chipping. Now, I'm not sure if you guys are used to seeing smiles up close like this, but this is my job. So I'm just showing you what, what I look at and take photos of every day. Um, I've, I've purposely, by the way, not chosen not to show you too much surgical work, just in case um, some of you are not really prepared to see that, but anyway, so in a case, in a case like this, um, you can see that we have reconstructed the shapes of the teeth and you don't need to be a dentist to kind of see that at the top, there was something, there was something lacking. We could see that the proportions of the teeth are not right. The central teeth compared to their neighbors seem large. We can see that there's chipping. Um, and that there is a lot of empty space. We call this negative space when we see these zigzagging bottoms. And I think we'll all agree that there's a bit of flow to her smile now. The proportions between her central teeth, lateral incisors and canines and so on are flowing much better. I think it will be interesting for you all to note that cosmetic dentistry is very closely studied. We study the proportions of the teeth um, we study how it all fits in with the face. So I don't know if anybody's had a chance to sort of understand facial aesthetics, but for example, you know, 
when we smile, you are trying to display as much teeth as possible. When you're at rest, you should be showing, you know, just two to three millimeters of teeth. And then we look at things like the shapes of the teeth. And there is a length to width ratio, which we follow. For example, the central tooth should have a height to width ratio that is around 80%. What that means is if it's 10 millimeters long, the width should be about eight millimeters. If somebody has tooth wear, such as in a case that I'll show you down here, let's say for example, in this case over here, even if you haven't got a dental degree, you can see in the upper photo that it does seem like the height to width ratio of this tooth is not as pleasant as the height to width ratio of the teeth up in the after treatment. If we look at it in the before, it almost seems like the height is actually less than the width. If you measured the width of the tooth from here to there, it would be a longer distance than from the top of the gum line down here. So we would say that this tooth has uh, a ratio above 100%, which means that it is wider than it is long. By lengthening the tooth, we restore it to the correct ratio. We also know that the central tooth should be larger than the lateral and the lateral to canine also has its proportion. So it's not something that is arbitrarily done. We follow a recipe. We look at the person's face and we match it to them. And I can, I guess if you looked at a photo like this on the left, the only difference between the photo on the left and the photo on the right, obviously apart from the fact that she's a little bit on the side here, is her teeth. But it's sometimes fascinating to see that all you've treated is the person's smile, but they seem to have an overall more vibrant look to themselves. Um, look at the way she's smiling on this photo on the left. It seems forced, doesn't it? You can see it in their eyes that they don't seem, it doesn't seem to be uh, emerging from her. It seems that she's applying herself to make this smile. Um, but when somebody is, is obviously uh, treated and, and you see in their eyes how effortlessly they smile, it's, it's a nice uh, rewarding feeling. Let's go to this case now. This is the case I wanted to show you and I'll walk you through the steps that I had to go through as a dentist to reach the end. It's all well and good to see these before and after and think, oh, wow, you know, that's a great result. Um, but it's important to know how much effort, training, and, and uh, planning went behind this case. So let's go through this case together, and then we will wrap it up and, and see if you had any questions for me. Okay. So again, would you agree that in this photo on the left, we see a person who, yes, they're smiling, but it does seem like the overall there is effort coming from them. It seems... Uh, a little bit forced. If you look at the eyes, it does seem that she's working hard to, to show me her teeth. Um, I'm happy to say that afterwards, every time she came in, it was actually really hard for me to force this smile out of her when I took the before photos, because she's just not used to it. Our muscles, uh, they have a memory. And if, if, you're, if you're uncomfortable smiling, the muscles have not developed that memory because they, they don't want to, to display the teeth. Um, and once we relieve that tension of just allowing that patient to no longer have that self-consciousness of their teeth, um, it's, it's amazing how vibrant and, and effortlessly she was just smiling as she spoke and laughed and, and that kind of thing. Let's walk through the details of this case. Have you all heard of Invisalign? I'm sure you have. It is an American uh, company after all. Has everybody here just maybe a show of hands if you've heard of Invisalign? Yep. So it's not the only company. What Invisalign has done for us is what has been around for ages, um, orthodontics. Orthodontics is where we reposition the teeth. I'm sure everybody knows that. Sometimes when a patient presents to you wanting, so this patient has had porcelain veneers between the upper and the lower. However, we didn't jump straight into the porcelain veneers. Reason being, if you look carefully, there are some teeth which are malpositioned. If you wanted to place veneers on this scenario as the teeth are malpositioned, you'll end up with veneers of different thicknesses. This veneer would have to be thick to bring the tooth out. 
this veneer would have to be thin to try and bring it back. Um, if we also zoom in a little and look at her bite, let's now look at her. This is a clean check, an animation that we will use when we are planning a case. Just waiting for that to load. What you might notice is that this patient, not only has she got that tooth, which I've pointed out, which is protrusive because of the crowding, but we have a situation where we have crossbite. Crossbite is where the upper teeth are actually biting on the inside of the lower teeth, as you can see in this scenario here. Now you can imagine that for me to lengthen some of these teeth, which is what is needed in her case, it's almost impossible because if I was to lengthen, say, this tooth, as she bit down, it would collide with the opposing. Same goes to here. How would we possibly add a veneer or lengthen this tooth and perhaps you know, provide it with a nicer face uh, if when she bit down, she, she bit over here? So step number one was to correct her bite, also known as an occlusion. So when we, when we plan this case, what we have what we are planning to do with the clear aligners is expand the upper teeth such that when we are finished, the bite is corrected. We also want to contract the lower teeth so that when we're finished, we have a swapping of the upper and the lower teeth in cross bite. Let's press play on this and see what happens. So as you can see, the teeth are moving to correct us into a, into a bite where we can now plan some videos. We'll just do that again. So before situation, we had a cross bite like this. We press play and we see that the aligning, alignment of the teeth occurs. Now you'd agree that even though the patient has completed aligners, the bite has improved, but we still have teeth. If we just look at the upper teeth only, we still have teeth with that ratio, which is incorrect. You remember talking about the height to width ratio? If you look at this tooth right now, and we were to measure, we would see that the height is definitely shorter than its width. So if this is say 10 millimeters, that width looks like it would be 12. So that 10 to 12 ratio is 120%. What we wanna see is around 80%. So we have to lengthen this here to a, almost double its height, so we can reverse that ratio, and then the rest goes here. So let's go ahead and see what phase two of this treatment was. So we completed the Invisalign, corrected the bite from here to here. Then we went and started what is known as digital smile design. Now bear with me, I'm going to load this for you so you can have a look um, at what is digital smile design. We are waiting for Google. So digital smile design is when somebody gets veneers designed or, or a smile designed for themselves. Can everybody see the screen fine? All is good. All right, I'm gonna push on. This is my ceramist over here. A ceramist works with a dentist a cosmetic dentist, uh, as you saw in the video, my work is to treat the patient. Their work is to physically make the things that we need. For example, if I'm, if I'm treating a patient with porcelain veneers, I will do all aspects of patient treatment. They come in when it comes time to design the smile, as I'm about to show you now, and then to physically make the porcelain veneers that I'm going to be applying onto this case. It all starts with a set of models of her existing situation. So this is after Invisalign, remember? You can see here that we have corrected the bite. Now it's time to correct the teeth themselves. Individually, we see again these teeth which are worn down, chipped, ground down, and unfortunately lacking that length so that we have the nice ratios of the teeth. So we start to plan. When you plan smiles, like I was explaining to you earlier, it's all, it's all quite closely studied. We want to see that there is a smile arc which follows a nice semicircle 
that semicircle should be, that curvature should be parallel to the curvature of the lip itself, the lower lip. So we can see that she's falling short of that nice curvature of the lower lip. We build in what we think would be nice looking heights and width, nice looking ratios. We look at it from the bird's eye view. This is what veneers would look like. The word veneer means facing. So we are literally adding faces onto her teeth. Uh, so we obviously, we superimpose it over the face um, just so that we know that it's not just looking good um, on the model. It actually looks good when you look at her face overall. We want to see that the midline of her face marries up with the midline of her teeth. We want to see that when she is on a profile view, that it sits parallel to her profile, not too in, not too out. Too far inward, she won't show enough teeth. Too far outward, she'd look like uh, Bugs Bunny or Mr. Ed. <laughs> so we want to we want to get it just right. We then look at her bite. The occlusion or the bite is a very sophisticated thing. Uh, we take it for granted, but we need to see that upper teeth overlap the lower teeth slightly. We need to see that all these points sit perfectly in the correct embrasures because, and I won't bore you with the details unless you're thinking of studying dentistry one day, the way our teeth fit together allows us to function. It allows us to chew our food. It protects our teeth so that when our lower jaw is moving in different directions, um, there are appropriate ramps for sliding left and right. Otherwise, we would all break our teeth when we ate. The way that they're designed, uh, it, it's actually, you know, we are, uh, the human body is fascinating, but one of the most fascinating things about dentistry is how our bite uh, is designed. We have a ratio of 85%, which is much closer to the ideal of 80. Um, technically, we could add a bit more length, but we decided not to because it, for her age, it worked out uh, better so to not have a tooth that was too long. Anyway, I hope this gave you a bit of a glimpse into some of the behind the scenes planning that goes ahead before we, um, uh, before we wrap up these cases. The good news is we made the porcelain veneers. We chose a color that was not unnatural for her age. Remember that you can always get, we joke about it, we actually call it Hollywood white down here in Australia. I don't know if that's appropriate or not, but when somebody gets veneers that are too white, we call them Hollywood white. Um, we, we aim for, we, we've got to look at the person We've got to look at their personality. Um, and there's nothing wrong with beautiful and white teeth. Uh, if that person is, you know, young, and they're an actress and, and they want to, to have that sort of very white look, absolutely, it sometimes works perfectly. But for this lovely patient, she was a bit older in age, uh, you know, a, a woman who would prefer to just be a bit subtle um, with the results. Uh, and she, uh, I think she chose appropriately. Um, so I hope they gave you a, a little glimpse into what goes behind the scenes of cosmetic dentistry. I do want to emphasize that it's like, it's not just about cosmetics. The core of what we do is about oral health. Um, in this picture, you'll see, we, you know, two of our, uh, this is one of our dentists and this is one of our nurses did a, a, a volunteer trip to the Philippines and they went out into rural and remote areas just simply teaching kids how to, to have the correct oral hygiene. Uh, even though we're in a very privileged situation being in a first world country and treating people for cosmetic reasons, uh, I have to say that dental decay is the most prevalent disease in the world. Um, and it's sad to see that it's actually very focused in the underprivileged. So, um, you know, sometimes we take for granted that we are able to, to perform these you know, beautiful and fancy procedures, but um, the core of all, you know, uh, all our study, the core, the core of all our efforts is actually dental health. Um, you couldn't possibly have any of the cosmetic treatments unless that person had very stable and controlled dental health. I, um, I don't want to take too much of your Friday, uh, I know it's Friday over there, is that right? It's Saturday afternoon over here. 
Um, it's uh, it, it's it's nice and it's nice and uh, sunny here in Australia. I know that some of you, unless you're in California, some of you are in the winter months. But um, I'm going to hand it over back to you now. And I know it was just a simple glimpse of of what I do every day. But I'm I'm here to sort of take any questions if you had any. Um, I'm happy to help McKenna if you wanted to take that now. That's no problem. At all. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much for speaking to us. Um, yeah, maybe for just a couple minutes, like 10, we can have a couple of questions. Um, I actually had a question just about your opinion on something. Um, a lot of the orthodontists that I've talked to over here, I've gotten a lot of mixed opinions on Invisalign versus like the classic metal braces. Would you say that they're equivalent in aligning and straightening and doing the right thing with teeth or would you lean towards the metal braces being more beneficial? Whenever, yeah, that's a great question. So Invisalign really had a challenge with um, changing the, the, the status quo about 20 years ago. It's been around for a while now. You'll find that orthodontists themselves will provide you with Invisalign aligners or sometimes they would choose the traditional braces. Whenever new and cutting edge technology comes to the front and challenges a traditional way of doing things that we've been doing it that we've been doing for 80 years, in that early period there's always going to be skeptics, but there's also going to be the early adopters. So my answer to that would be Invisalign has proven, I'm no advocate for Invisalign by the way, I get no uh, just, just want to make sure that everybody's aware that none of the things that I've presented, I don't have any uh, conflict of interest at all. I don't get any benefits from any of those companies. It's just what I use in my office. I think that in 2021, the treatment in Invisalign versus traditional braces is probably 50-50. The things that influence it are patients and what they really want. Um, obviously, the provider and what they're comfortable using and the age of the age of the patient. So the biggest difference between Invisalign and braces for me is that you can't take braces off. Whereas Invisalign, you can. You take them out, you know, to brush your teeth and eat and so on. But as far as performance, I would say that about 80 to 90% of cases can be done with both. There will be those 10% of cases that maybe it's better to stick to the traditional braces. Um, Funnily enough, there are actually some cases, 10% of cases that probably actually better to do it with a clear aligner rather than traditional braces. So it really just depends on the person that, is, that you're seeing and it depends on the operator and what they prefer. But um, they, they have a lot of overlap. There are many things you can do with both. Okay, awesome, thank you. Um, and like I said in the chat, if you guys want to type your questions there or if you just want to unmute and ask really quickly go for it and if nobody has any questions after like five minutes then we can go ahead and wrap up absolutely okay the most common cause of there's a question here, what is the most common cause of misshapen teeth? Um, I would say congenitally, so your genetics determine the shape of your teeth. Uh, some of us have teeth that are smaller than others and others have teeth that are shaped differently. I wanna emphasize that aesthetics, there's no such thing as classic ideal shape. It's all about whether it suits your face. So you'd be interested to know, if you have a rounded face and rounded eyes and rounded features in general, chances are, if you look at your teeth, they'll have slightly rounded features also. Um, if you're somebody whose features are sharper, square face, um, we look at the shape of the face, we look at the structure of the eyebrows and the eyes, chances are your teeth will also have squarish shapes. So there's no right or wrong, just about making sure that it works for you. The other most common reason of misshapen teeth, I would say would be damage. So damage from, so the older lady that you saw that I did the knees with, um, she had been grinding her teeth for, you know, better half of 20 years. So obviously by the time she saw me, they, they were much shorter than, than they would have been when she was 20. Um, so I guess 
tooth wear or damage to your teeth is some of it is inevitable, but a lot of it is preventable. So the key is to get in touch with a dentist from a very young age so that you can prevent you can prevent uh, any any you know excessive damage to your teeth heading forward. Another question here, what made you interested in cosmetic dentistry specifically? It's a good question. It, it, there were colleagues of my mother's when I was young that had a practice and performed cosmetic dentistry. Um, my younger sister, Miriam, had orthodontics and, and um, really improved, dramatically improved the appearance of her teeth when she was younger. So I saw the difference that it can have to somebody's life. Um, I know that sometimes when we're in health, we can sometimes feel that if something is being done for cosmetic reasons, that it is not as important. Um, obviously, life-threatening things or things that are affecting our health and stability are more important. But once those things are stable, helping someone be less um, uh, self-conscious of their smile, in my opinion, it does a lot for their health in other ways. Um, their, their, their general well-being, their, their general confidence, it, it could improve their um, quality of life and mental health and so on. So if somebody is, is uh, self-conscious about something and comes to seek my help, I take it seriously. I don't dismiss it as, oh, it's not important. I, I really do uh, hope that I can help them if that's what bothers them. Um, so that's what made me interested in cosmetic dentistry, seeing, seeing some, some dentists that I saw when I was at a young age, but I saw the difference it can make to somebody's life. The other influential factors that led me into dentistry, are, I would say my, my, my parents, my mum's a dentist and my father was a medical doctor, a, a general practitioner. And they absolutely left it up to me. Like if I wanted to enter law, they would be very supportive. If I wanted to, to study a commerce or a engineering or an architecture degree of any kind, I think the only thing they said to me is, um, you know, I was obviously uh, without being, without tooting my horn too much, but obviously I was academically talented or gifted. And they just said, look, if this is what you're good at, it'd be a shame to put it to waste. Make sure you study well and make the most of your your talent there, I guess, you know, everybody's good at something different. You know, if I was an elite sports guy, I'm sure they would have encouraged me to make the most of that talent, you know, but um, uh, my, my tennis skills are uh, mediocre, unfortunately. So, yeah, I think it was my upbringing, my parents and um, yeah, their colleagues that I saw that, that got me into it. Doesn't look like there are any other questions. If there are any last final questions, please let me know. I'd be happy to help. Tips for good oral health, especially for bleeding gums when brushing. Definitely. One of the biggest tips I'll give you is don't avoid an area that is bleeding. One of the most common mistakes that patients make is they have an area that perhaps when they floss it, it bled. And they think, well, maybe I should avoid that area because it's, it's potentially I uh, could do more harm. Uh, it's actually the opposite with our teeth. If there's an area that bleeds when you brush, it's, it's kind of screaming out to you saying, I need your attention. Chances are there is plaque that's been catching there for a while. So give it more attention. And you should notice that every time you go back there and clean it well, it bleeds a little bit less and less as the days go on. Uh, I've got a question here, how much school did you have to go through? Um, a fair bit of school. I had to go through, obviously, high school. And then we, you, in Australia, you would do an undergraduate degree, which is college for you guys, I think, three years or so. And then after that, you enter the uh, postgraduate degree for about five years. So it's, it's, about, it's about six to seven years of, of uh, university level study. Uh, tips to whiten your teeth. Um, yeah, see, see your health professional, your dental health professional. There are some over-the-counter products that you can get, and some of them tend to work well. Um, but basically, to whiten your teeth, it starts with hygiene, uh, really good hygiene. Second step is a professional clean. And then third step would be um, in the event that you want to whiten, 
um, you can then get, uh, I guess, uh, peroxide from your dentist. So they can make you whitening trays or, or zoom whitening gel. All right, uh, McKenna, over to you. Yes, thank you. Um, so thank you again so much for joining us and talking to us. And thank you everybody else that came out tonight or morning, wherever you are. Um, I'm going to send the link in the chat. I just sent it to the Google form. So make sure you go fill it out. You just have to put your name, your email, and kind of how you heard about ISPR. And we'll send out the certification for today. Um, other than that, if you have any questions, feel free to ask me um, or email us. But you're free to go. And just thank you again, Dr. Tucson, for joining us. We absolutely loved having you. My pleasure. I hope you all have a lovely weekend. Bye. Bye, -bye. Thank you.